Okay, everyone. So welcome to unit uh, three, and we're going to talk about economics. Not my super favorite topic, but one that is uh, important to what we what we talk about here in um, the world issues. So uh, we're going to kick off talking about food and agricultural issues because one of the big issues uh, with economics um, and that that fits in nicely dovetails nicely into economics is food. Because the one thing that we all need uh, is food. Well, food and water. But this is um, how how kind of we look at food. So let's talk about food and agricultural issues. So the nature of hunger. We're going to start there. So it's easy for uh, people in old core countries uh, to dis dismiss all hunger problems as famine. Most hunger deaths, though, are not a famine. Um, and what exactly is a famine? A famine is a severe short-term shortage of food uh, because of problems with the food distribution or production of it. Um, so this means uh, maybe it can be a, um, a drought, which would lead to crops not growing. And then this in turn then leads to a food shortage, hence famine. And famine uh, leads to starvation. Uh, it can be because, like I mentioned, of natural disasters like a drought, or it can be man-made. Uh, so just a, a picture of an example of uh, poor cows dying because of drought. Um, fish drying up in lakes, uh, potatoes uh, getting a uh, rot, um, blight, potato blight is specifically that um, rate of population decline in some areas depending on how, uh, and then of course uh, more just more famine. So starvation itself is extreme hunger over a long period of time. Uh, so when you say you're starving, you're technically not correct. Uh, starvation is for a long period of time, long, long period of time. Um, and what happens when we do not get the essential vitamins? Um, we need fat, carbohydrates, minerals, vitamins, and proteins. And when you don't get all of those things, starvation can happen. And this is where food start of starvation, shortages and starvation regularly occur. Chronic hunger, uh, not starvation, chronic hunger, uh, more than 850 million people around the world suffer for this. Um, so this means you're not starving, but you don't have access to a reliable food source. So this is an insecure supply of food that you have. Um, you can't pay enough for or to grow enough food to support yourself. Uh, seasonal hunger. Um, it can be one of these. For example, if you're living in Canada and maybe you grow all your own food in the growing season, which is short, there are six months of winter where you would not have access to grow, being able to grow food. So this is what leads to seasonal hunger. So chronic hunger affects more people than starvation. Starvation is extreme. Chronic hunger is something that is not necessarily as visible as starvation. Malnutrition is something that's rel relatively common. It's just a medical condition for poor health. You're not getting enough of a nutrient or too much of one nutrient. If you, for example, only eat potatoes, uh, you're not getting all the required nutrients that you need and getting too much starch. Um, so some of the most common malnutrition issues um, uh, cow shock, I can't say that one, protein, uh, what, what happens when you don't get enough protein, you lose muscle mass, um, poor immune system swelling um, of the belly, that's why sometimes you see in photos of starving children, the bellies are distended, swollen out, um, that is a lack of protein, scurvy, vitamin C, you've probably heard this, often um, attributed with pirates, uh, people who would go out on long sea voyages and not get enough vitamin C. And this is anemia, weakness, uh, gum disease, bleeding skin, sores, uh, pellagra, uh, nicotine and tritoparin, scaly skin, diarrhea, mental illness, anemia is a lack of iron, uh, lack, uh, lack of energy, weakened immune system. Um, and then vitamin A leads, can lead to blindness. Um, and vitamin B1, damage to the heart and nervous system. And then, of course, uh, calories and protein leads to starvation. So, some of the myths. So, here is a uh, kind of a map of um, hunger, basically. 
um, the uh, red is extreme hunger, uh, uh, the white is less so, it's industrialized um, areas, so note um, North America, Australia, so Central Europe here, um, and then you kind of have uh, low and no data, just means we don't have the data on the countries to know about hunger. There could be a concern. Um, the bottom 16 countries on the list of uh, GHI on the hunger index are uh, here. You can kind of see a bit of a um, correlation between it and the periphery countries or developing countries. So there are a lot of things that can create problems for agriculture. Um, Canada is lucky because we have a few things, a few good things going for it. Um, we have uh, good soil. Oh my God, I'm right in my head. We have good soil. <laughs> we have good soil, um, uh, reliable growing seasons, um, and uh, plenty of land that allows us to go around and, and be able to grow reliably uh, throughout the year. Uh, so agricultural success, success itself, um, it needs certain things. Obviously, insufficient sunlight can limit growth. You need a lot of sun. Um, insufficient precipitation, you need rain or water of some sort. The land is not good for growing too hilly. Flatland with high water table can be an issue. That's you, swamp, basically. You can't grow in a swamp. Um, destructive organisms, pests that lead to issues on it as well. Uh, you do need helpful organisms. Uh, and if you don't have those, that's not gonna do either. Too much moisture and too little or um, insufficient uh, soil, which is under me here, but that's, that's what you see. So you need a lot of things. A lot of things actually need to go right to be able to farm. A lot of people feel farming is easy. You put the uh, seed in the ground and it grows, which isn't true. Um, it's actually quite a difficult, uh, to a difficult thing to do, so uh, it, it's unfair to say it's it's easy. Um, some deficiencies: if your growing season is too long or too short, insufficient moisture, infertile soils, hilly terrain, low lying wet terrain, shortage of beneficial insects, excess of harmful insects, and excess of weeds. So there is a lot of things that need to go right in order for you to successfully farm something, and it's a lot of work. Um, and it can and it can be difficult. It can be very difficult. You can't just pick up and become a farmer. There's a lot of um, things you need to know and a lot of things you need to understand in order to be successful at it. So we break down agriculture into two major types. Um, the first type is uh, for food, which is what we call subsistence farming and also cash cropping. Uh, the second is about um, the work necessity of a farm, intensive and extensive farming. So start with subsistence farming. Uh, this is you just trying to grow enough food to feed yourself. Uh, you usually have a lot of different types of products and a smaller bit of land. So if you're subsistence farming, you may have cows and sheep and pigs, but you may also have some corn and some beans and some squash and those sorts of things. So you would have a multiple stuff available to you in order for you to survive and eat. That is subsistence farming. You're subsist subsiding on what you are able to grow and produce yourself. This is the oldest type of farming and the one that has been around historically the longest. Uh, from when he during the agricultural revolution, when humans went from hunters uh, to specifically settling in one place and beginning to farm the land. So this has been around for many, many years. And it is something that, uh, although was kind of dying out for a while, has begun to make a bit of a resurgence again, especially recently, where people are wondering with the issues of the pandemic and not having access to food, a lot of people are now growing their own stuff, which is kind of an interesting one. Um, but this is this is what people do. Uh, any extra food you have left is sold to pay for other things that you may need as a family or that you cannot grow, uh, for example. A uh, good example here in Canada, uh, you would not be able to grow your own coffee. Uh, the climate does not allow for it, so you could sell what you have in order to purchase coffee. So that sort of stuff. Cash cropping. Um, this is specifically to make money. 
you usually uh, farm all of one thing and then you sell it for money later. Um, usually one or maybe two products, but usually just one specific product. Uh, one of the greatest examples probably is uh, cotton, which yes, cotton does actually grow. Uh, and you pick the cotton and then it's turned into um, uh, a fabric at that point. But cash cropping is making money. A whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of one thing to sell for money. Intensive farming uh, means you have a, a relatively small amount of land. Uh, you have a high amount of labor and technology, uh, and you have high yields. So, for example, here in Canada, we have vineyards, which are a big wine, and it's not a huge farm, but it all specifically focuses on grapes. You've got a lot of help, and you've got the technology to do so. Um, livestock, cows and pigs can also be included in intensive farming. And the, the object here is to make as much as you can, produce, produce as much as you can, very high yields. Extensive farming is a large amount of land, not a lot of technologies, not a lot of workers, um, and it's usually pretty low yields and not a lot of profit to it. If there's too much land and not enough help to be able to uh, work the land, it's it's more like do as much as you can and hope for the best sort of sort of farming. Now, so the Green Revolution uh, was started as a way to better provide for populations. Um, an American foundation was asked by the Mexican government to develop different types of wheat uh, in order to be able to grow better or grow more efficiently. Um, so they did come up with a couple of varieties, uh, smaller but more focused on the seeds, better response to inputs from us, and faster growing um, uh, to, to allow. And yes, they can genetically modify seeds. They do this by breeding seeds. Um, that won't get into the science of it, A, because I don't fully understand it myself and be because I'm not a science person but if you are interested in a little bit more about uh, crossbreeding um, and, and that sort of stuff so countries all over the world have used um, methods developed by the green revolution to see massive growth in wheats to allow more success of growing meats higher yields more food less starvation uh, food production went up 20 percent faster than the population did, which was fantastic because you want your food to outstripe your population. However, with this issue, we have lost a lot of genetic diversity. Hundreds of types were replaced by one or two types. So hundreds of different types of things um, were lost because most of it was specifically focused on this uh, one or two that grew really fast and regularly and reliably. Um, so then that begs the question, if so, why are we worried about this loss of genetic diversity? Just like people, right? Um, sometimes there can be issues with uh, no difference. Most small farms um, cannot afford the required technology. There is a lot of technology that goes into farming, especially large farms, a lot of uh, large tractors and, and work they go into it and a lot of small farms can't afford it because they're very expensive. Um, the unsuitable system, the seeds lost some product productivity over the years, soil fertility was impacted and uh, pests and uh, developed immunities to it. So these are some of the issues that came out of this green revolution, which we are now seeing the repercussions of now. Um, and then of course they, uh, because of the issue of the bugs, they, we've got more fertilizers, pesticides, fertilizers, and technology selling more stuff in order for you to more successfully use the same seeds that were working before. So that's kind of a cycle, a vicious cycle here. Uh, research focused on the fertile soils and areas with reasonable rain. Most of the world's poor populations, though, live in poor rainfall and in fertile soils. So unfortunately, even though the seeds were made for a specific climate, they did not have as good an impact on other climates as well. So we do have the, the issues there. Um, research mostly focused on the staples, or what we call staples of the diet, which were wheat, rice, and corn. So those are kind of the big three. Africa and other countries in the developing world um, do not use these grains as their staple, however, uh, which is unfortunate They use because they can't grow it. Um, because uh, the soil does not allow 
big word. Um, mechani mechanization reduced jobs in developing countries. Uh, biotechnology is the application of biological processes for agriculture and industrial purposes. Biotechnology is used to create genetically modified organisms. Um, so these foods address some problems about what we have with food today. And uh, what, so, so what are those? So, so what are these things that, that they have? Um, golden rice. Uh, vitamin A deficiency is a serious problem, and a lot of uh, kind of lack of food choice leads to the rice being a staple. Uh, so not a lot of vitamin A is absorbed. Um, so there is they created a grain of rice with vitamin A, hence the golden rice, uh, and this allowed them to get that needed nutrient. A lot of people are opposed to eating foods, however, that are genetically modified, um, sometimes called frankenfoods. Uh, and so there are concerns about uh, eating, uh, eating, ingesting types of things that can be an issue. So GMO is kind of the, the terminology we use, genetically modified um, organisms, so that's GMO. So some of the issues are these potential for superbugs, superweeds, um, because uh, as the uh, product develops, um, nature kind of rebounds and comes back can come back at it. Uh, always a good premise for a horror movie, of course. Uh, so we have this this potential for a superbug that would um, be modified by eating the modified foods. Um, and then as the foods develop, who owns the rights to these foods that have been developed? Um, GMO seeds also degrade over time. And because they don't last, the farmers are forced to buy more of them, which is a bit of a money grab there. Uh, Terminator technology. Um, Terminator technology here is that the if the idea behind it is if these um, plants were to get into the wild that they would uh, self-destruct basically so they would not overtake um, natural wildlife however this gene could actually end up in the world which would have consequences there as well um, there's not enough research being done on GMOs um, and there's not enough labeling rules uh, when it comes to GMOs so we're not seeing the consequences of GMOs and we don't actually know which ones we're putting in our bodies because it's not in the law that they have to all be listed on products so when you start thinking about it it can be relatively dangerous uh, this of course also back to our loss of genetic diversity um, it's good to keep many different species to spread out the genes, but if we limit them, there's a lot more of a risk. Um, the UN guesses that 70% of the plant's genetic diversity of agricultural was lost in the 20th century. And the reason can, is fairly simple. Our superbug comes in and destroys all the crops. And because they're all the same, none of the crops survive. So this is what uh, the issue becomes with the lack of genetic diversity here. Uh, land reforms. So in the near core and periphery countries, there is a um, increasing need to carry out land reforms. Um, land is also all usually given to the wealthy. People can afford it. Um, and then what they do is something called sharecropping, uh, where they basically allow you to farm their land in exchange for giving them profit while you only make a smaller profit, although you're doing all the work. Sharecropping is not borderline serfdom, uh, if you go back to the early days of history. Women in agriculture. In a lot of countries in Africa, it's the women who are responsible for farming, the majority of the food production. Um, giving women the economic freedom to buy their own land would go a long way to helping um, develop developing countries and to to be able to support them better uh, because that that is what they do the the men maybe work or look at tend the animals but it's usually the women who um, are running the farm they're the ones who are farming uh, so the idea here behind um, aspects of subsidiaries and damaging aspects um, supplement farmers incomes thus giving them a higher standard of living provide income that enables farmers to continue farming help farmers reduce a, um, country needs thus making them less encourage farmers to grow increase production food diversity help create surplus um, so 
this is the idea behind uh, supporting farmers, giving them uh, a boost, if you will. Uh, and then on the other side, of course, if you don't, um, the majority of them go under and they can't provide. Cover up some crops, but not other farmers. Grow non subsidized crops. Don't benefit. Foster dependency on government. Increased prices of inputs on land. Developed countries lead to overproduction. And this leads to low prices and leads to international trade wars between the other two old, old core countries. Corporate farming. Um, everywhere in the world, we find corporate farms. Uh, most farms are family farms, and this is passed down over time. Uh, corporate farming has been increasing. Corporate farming takes advantage of um, the economies of scale. This means that the cost decreases and the scale of the operation increases. So the bigger the farm, um, the more output, the more money you make, the more hands you can hire to work your farm. Um, it's kind of like a factory. It brings in similar practices to that. Um, Hog and other livestock factories with automated systems where they feed the animals measured food and water, vitamins are injected, but um, animals are not treated well. Uh, the main goal here is profit. So how little do we need to get the most out of the animals? So this is where you start running into those issues with people um, with animal rights organizations and how poorly animals are treated uh, in order to, to do that. Um, Companies control more parts of the industry, so this is called vertical integration, where companies dominate all segments, seeds, fertilizer, equipment, transportation, storage, process, and retail. And because of these, companies are massive and bring in money to economies. They have a lot of influence. So, for example, uh, if we use McDonald's, um, which sells the food, but you backtrack, McDonald's is the one who owns the farm. They're the ones who are the people on the farm. So this type of thing... Uh, is is what we call vertical integration of farming and so this brings and, and there's a problem with this because this brings in so much money to so many economies so a lot of people have a hard time uh, dealing with that so the search for sustainable agriculture so what 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 are we doing so organic farming and you've probably heard this or seen um, labels in the grocery store on the food uh, they develop this because of the concerns over the GMOs and the pesticides that are being used on the um, crops. So organic farming, uh, they do not use fertilizers or pesticides or growth hormones or medicines or food additives. This is all natural food taken directly from the farm and given to you. And it, it is kind of an upwards trend right now. Organ organic farming is very popular. Um, instead of using methods, organic farmers like things like cage-free poultry, crop rotation, more than one crop in the same field, leaving crop residue on the land, using animals and green manure to increase soil nutrition. So that means they um, don't keep their animals in cages, they let them roam free, uh, they rotate their crops, they grow more than one, uh, they leave behind some compost in order to fertilize the ground, and they use the manure of animals in order to, to do that. So some of the drawbacks to organic farming, um, some organic pesticides are toxic to insects, not just target ones. Uh, so they they kill not just the good insects, they kill not the bad ones, but the good ones as well. Um, manure contaminates water sources. So using cow poo, for example, um, if it gets into the water, it's not good. Um, not efficient, organic farms don't have a lot of yield compared to conventional farmer, and therefore it's usually more expensive. Twice the price, uh, ideally, if you depending on what you're buying. But the growth of the organic movement has been ongoing, um, very much so. It grows about 15-20% per year. Only 1.5 farmers in Canada are certified organic. Most are uh, corporate farms. So it is a growing trend, but not quite yet. Um, so food miles is a relatively new measure of sustainability for food. Um, it is to be suitable, people should try to keep this number as small as possible. So ideally, you want to buy foods that come from not very far away. Um, and the first idea is to figure out how much, uh, how far the food travels to get to your plate. So that can be kind of an interesting one to figure out how long it takes for your food to get to you. Uh, the second measure of how far your food travels uh, to get to you is our carbon footprint. 
which is the amount of greenhouse gases that are being produced in order to create our food. And as we know, cows themselves are a huge contributor to um, greenhouse gases, which is kind of an odd one, but that's true. Uh, if you walk to the grocery store instead of driving, for example, uh, you can get more food. The average distance of 50 common food items was found to be 4,497 kilometers. So that's kind of a wild uh, journey. And that's a lot of carbon being uh, used in order to produce your food. Uh, there are critics, of course, to this idea of calculation of food miles. Um, what if you buy organic, highly effective grown apples from California instead of ineffectively grown apples in New York? Uh, what's the argument there? Transportation is only one measure of, of our food. So it, it, it does have its drawbacks to it as well. Um, a, there was a movement in 2005 called the 100 mile diet. Uh, the idea is to only eat locally sourced foods. Um, and this means going to farmers markets, eating mainly organic, driving as little as possible. So you would only eat food that you can get within 100 miles of you. Uh, um, like know that it has come from 100 miles from you. So that would be a very interesting one. So what is the future of global agriculture? So there are a lot of is issues with sustainability in the way we grow food right now. Um, and we're seeing that, especially uh, during the COVID crisis, where we saw a lot of that. Uh, we use too much water, too many fossil fuels, grow too much food, waste. Um, and and we, we have just, just too much. The only possible solution is biofuel. And this is a fuel created from organic um, material. We have corn-based fuels, sugar-based fuels. Um, but what what's the risk of this? Um, the movements of eat local actually also hurts developing countries because a lot of them are selling their foods to the corporations over. Um, there's already low prices for commodities, so fathers, fa farmers, <laughs> farmers lose money on the stuff that they do sell. Developing countries cannot compete with subsidiaries offered to richer farmers. Fair trade is a way to help combat this. You may see fair trade on stuff. That means that the producers in developing countries receive a fair price for their products um, that is above market price. So that is one way to combat that. If you see something with a fair trade um, on it, that's what that means. Um, there is no one answer, though, to this. Uh, we can all do things in small parts to help ourselves, however. Um, buy locally uh, when the goods are in season. So farmers markets, you have from buy, buy local, buy from local farmers if possible all the time if they have so support poor farmers around the world by buying fair trade if you can in store buy more frozen dried or canned food in the winter, walk to your local store or buy in bulk, purchase organic when you can demand more organics from your local store buy things with less packaging and in bulk and support NGOs that build well, supply food, or provide other assistance to the world's poor. And NGOs is uh, non-governmental organizations, a charity that support these things. Okay, so that was a long one. Uh, that was a lot to talk about in terms of agriculture and sustainable agriculture. Thank you for staying with me for our first lecture in this unit. And uh, that is it for now. Uh, on to your first assignment in this unit, and uh, we will see about eating some local um, food. Okay, guys, that's it for me. Have a good one.